Welcome everybody. Hello. Great to have you here with us. Hello, welcome. So feel free to uh, kind of give a shout out in the chat, uh, where you're from, maybe what your role is, how much agile experience you've got, if you have any familiarity with the uh, flow. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody who's joining. Feel free to uh, type up in the chat where you're from, uh, your role, what ex experience you've got, if any, with Agile, just to give a sense kind of who's with us here at this webinar. It will be fun to. Uh, to get to know you a little bit this way. Mm -hmm. Hey Cluj, welcome from Romania and John, London, mm -hmm. Andrea and Andre. Welcome everybody. All right, we already have a lot of people from uh, globally across the world really nice so everybody who's joining feel free to kind of type up in the chat a little bit uh, your role where you're from and uh, a little bit about your agile experience we we'll let people kind of join in flow into the webinar give it a few minutes and then we'll get started soon So everybody who's joining, feel free to say hello. Hi, Rasul. Okay. Welcome everybody who's joining. We're great to see where you're from, where were you're uh, what your role is, a little bit about your Agile experience. Okay, it looks like we've got quite a lot of experienced people here. Wonderful. Okay. And also, if you don't have that much Agile experience, no problem. Let us know. We'll, we'll be able to, um, to kind of see what we're doing throughout the webinar. Okay. Welcome, Louise, Adele. Great to have you all. Okay. So it's almost time to get started. We'll let people kind of the last people uh, joining. What's the weather like where you're at? We've got people all over the place. It's nice and sunny for me over here. In Israel, wet. Oh, wet and cold, or just wet? UK, it's kind of wet all all over. No, all year long. <laughs> okay, sunny and warm. Cool. All righty, sunny South Africa. Wow. Okay, so where wherever you're at, and whatever weather is, uh, kind of. Uh, surrounding you. It's great to have you all here. We'll get started in a moment. For anybody who just kind of uh, joined, please feel free to um, write up uh, where you're from, what your role is, how much agile experience you have. If you don't, we'll, we'll love to get to know you a little bit through uh, this chat and we'll get started momentarily. Okay. All right. All right, Dolly, shall we? Yes, let's start. We have 36 participants. Uh, I guess some will continue joining 
throughout the session, but let's uh, honor the people who came on time. Yes, absolutely. So we will get started. And by the way, folks, we have a Q&A panel here in this webinar. So as we're uh, going through, if you have any questions that you would like us to address, feel free to to uh, write them in the Q&A panel just so that they don't get lost in case there's some discussion going on. Hey, Uri, nice to see you uh, on online as well. And uh, we will uh, get started. So we are here to discuss how to achieve team flow by optimizing your time in the zone. We hope that this will be uh, an opportunity for you to uh, uh, really get a sense for how we can have sustainable team flow, leveraging the agile team events that uh, are essentially part of our day-to-day -day in the agile uh, environment. We have here a joint collaboration between uh, myself from Agile Sparks and Ori Tal from Peak Flow. So Ori, it's really great to be here with you. Yes, thank you. All right, you. off we go. Okay. So try to think about the times when you felt you are in the zone. It may be in a game that you played, maybe in some sport, maybe a different activity, maybe at work. Try to think about these moments. So musicians call these moments getting in the groove and uh, athletes call it getting in the zone. And there is one person who called it flow. And this guy is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He's a positive psychologist and he researches about flow, creativity and happiness. And what he says about flow, he says flow occur when one is completely involved in an activity where every action Every movement, every thought follows in inevitably from the previous one. So there's like a smooth kind of smooth flow. And this is why I called it flow states. So the, there is a definition for flow. Uh, it's an optimal state of consciousness where you feel your best and you perform your best. So it's a combination of feeling and performing. It's also known as being in the zone or um, when a person is fully involved in the activity that, that he's doing and feeling really enjoyment and achieving his goals. Yeah, so we're curious, how often do you guys actually feel like you're in the flow at work? How often does that happen for you? Let's see, we'll put up a Mentimeter here. Hopefully you can see the QR code, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can use the QR code or go to menti.com and oops. yes, and you should add the code number on yes. the top. Yeah, and you have the code. I'll enter it also in the chat for anybody that finds it easier. Let's try to see how often does this happen for you. Yeah, so we're starting to get some numbers in. in. <laughs> okay, yes. It looks like mostly rarely. Yeah, really. Let's see. Okay, we've got a few people who are having a bit more of that flow day to day. Okay, great. All right, so we can see as everybody is continuing to uh, kind of chime in, we, we do have 62%, about 60% of the people who are saying rarely, rarely seeing that they are in the flow at work. So, you know, the... Um, the thing is, I guess it's it not says so... that most of them are, are managers. I think that's this is what it says because managers usually their job is to make their team be in the flow. Uh, so so managers have a different kind of flow. I guess uh, most of here are, are managers. Perhaps we've got some product designers here on the chat. Okay, so actually, it's not so surprising that we're seeing such a large percentage of people who are rarely in the flow at work because research is showing has shown us that we have only 5% of our work life that is actually in the flow. Such a small percent, and this is for the general population, so perhaps we have a little bit of a better experience when we are um, in other, uh, in our um, uh, fields, maybe, mm -hmm. but, you know, it is important. So why is it important, uh, Ori? Yeah, so we... there's a lot of, a lot are talking about flow in, in the context of business, uh, because flow, you can see it in the context of sports, of creativity, of uh, art, but also in business. And Forbes 
uh, one of the biggest business uh, magazines, he, it's, they said that flow is the number one metric that you want to measure in teams. And so you can also see, if we go to the next slide, so you can also see that there are um, a lot of measurements that are uplifting, such as creativity, productivity, skill acquisition, creative problem solving. So this is a state where a lot of our uh, abilities are increasing uh, in a very dramatic way. So there are companies that are using uh, the flow concept and they're also measuring uh, flow. So for example, in Patagonia, they have this rule, it co it's called let my people surf. And it says that when there are there is waves, so uh, you can go out to surf because they know that this is a kind of an activity that will help you get into the flow. And then you come back to the office. So you're much more focused and you're much more creative. Yeah, actually, I live in Haifa, which also has good surf. And I used to live in San Diego, which also had great surf. So I can really relate to that. <laughs> yeah. It so is how, how do you know so much about flow? <laughs> So I, I teach and coach people how to be, how to reduce their stress and in increase their focus. I studied at the Flow Research Collective, which is the global uh, research organization that teaches uh, and researches about flow. And this is what I do. I work with people, with managers, with entrepreneurs, and helping them with uh, neuroscience techniques, how to facilitate peak flow performance in their work, like on a day-to-day, -day, on, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about you, Ronnie? Tell us about your about you. Yeah, so I care about flow because uh, I'm a, a lean agile business transformation coach, and basically it means that I help organizations to improve their effectiveness, how they deliver more value to their customers, how they work better together. And flow is a, a big deal because when we don't have flow, we have a lot of challenges in being able to, to achieve this. So I'm interested in flow from that perspective in the organization, in the team, and also on an individual level within that context. Yes. All right, so what we'll talk about in this webinar, basically, uh, we'll start with uh, a little bit more about flow. We touched on it already, just a tad more. Understand what is team flow? How does it relate to, um, uh, to uh, our work? And then we'll talk about some common challenges that we see in agile team events and offer some ways to implement team flow in them but once we understand the science behind those challenges that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. All right, so first a little bit more about flow. So we mentioned that we come at towards flow from somewhat different directions. From the lean agile direction, we have the scaled agile framework or SAFE, which refers to flow in, um, in a manner of Having flow occurs when there is a smooth, linear, and fast movement of work product from step to step in a relevant value stream, right? So that's what I was referring to before. When we start out from where we have an idea of something we want to build that may provide value to our customers, how do we understand that value, that need better, define it internally so we can um, understand what we want to build internally, understand how to build it, and get that out, get quick feedback, and um, ultimately get that value to our customers as quickly as possible. So how do we make that flow? Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's talk about how does it feel when you're in the flow? So there are four main characters for flow. You can, uh, you can, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the acronym of STAIR. C S is selfless, T is timeless, E is effortless and richness. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each and every one of these. So what does it mean selfless? When we are in the zone, we feel that we are kind of merging with the action that we are doing. So it feels like there's nothing else except me and the thing that I'm doing. And also uh, there is this inner voice, this inner critic who always has something to say. So it gets quiet when you're in flow. So basically what's, what you're feeling is you're feeling less yourself. The next mm -hmm. one is Timeless, when you're in flow, time passes strangely. The definition is called time dilation. And usually time kind of goes fast, but sometimes it just goes like in a slow motion. If you know, uh, for example, in the metrics scene, when Neo is, is uh, dodging the bullets, so there's a slow motion there. So mm -hmm. sometimes it gets fast and sometimes it gets slow. 
Cool. The next one is effortless. And by the way, the, the, the reason why time passes strangely is because there is a part in our brain, which is called the prefrontal cortex. He is less activated. And this is the part who is also calculating the linear time. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about effortless. Um, when we are in flow, it feels that it's effortless. It feels that there is a, like a back wind, something that is helping us. And there is a paradox here. And it's called the paradox of effortless. It means that if you want everything to be effortless, so you cannot be in flow in the long term because flow requires you to stretch your abilities a little bit sometimes in order to gain uh, the skills that you need to perform it in an effortless state. Hmm. So the next one is richness. So when we are in flow, our senses are much more open. Our data acquisition is uplifting. We can, we can see more things in our eyes. We can get more information. And we can also kind of uh, recognize the connection between the dots due to the dopamine that helps us kind of zoom out and see the connections. And there's mm. also a paradox here, which is called the paradox of control. Because when I feel that I am in control and I can understand everything, so sometimes there is this voice in our head who said, you know what, I'm so good, I'm perfect, and maybe it means that I can do this and that. And then you're starting to think, to think, and this is the time when you're getting out of the zone because flow needs you to be selfless. You need to be to take your feelings and your thoughts outside of the game. Mm -hmm. So this is the four characters of flow. Okay. And so flow has this kind of sweet spot. So, so basically, it's it's like the uh, it's the border between your challenge and your skill. So if you have a high skill and your challenge is lower than your skill, so you're getting to the boredom area because it's mm -hmm. easy for you and there's no flow in the boredom area. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if the challenge is so high and it's much above your skills, so you get into the anxiety level, which is too hard, and then you get very stressed. So flow is kind of the sweet spot between this, and this is called the challenge skill balance. It is a ratio. People talk about 5% which is the ratio, 5% more than what you think you can do. This is the, the good stretch. Um, right. And so, you know, there are a lot of things that can help us kind of reduce the stress or maybe balance the challenge skill. Uh, and maybe, Ronnie, you have some ideas about maybe some AI tools that helps you reduce the challenges. Yeah, we've actually had this experience, you know, more recently in the past year as Gen AI has become more prevalent and we're, we've been learning all how to use it. And uh, what, what I've been seeing is that for both situations where we kind of have that anxiety that you described, like maybe now we want to be uh, figuring out, okay, we have some feature that we want to be, or epic that we want to be defining, but it's a little bit hard to get the words right of how we want to define the benefit hypothesis and the acceptance criteria. So we can leverage, we've been leveraging Gen AI, whether it's ChatGPT, Qua, Dante, whatever, your tool of choice and um, uh, asking it to help us out, basically giving the context, you have to give it enough context so that it gives you something meaningful and not generic. And once you do that, you're able to actually kind of get out of that uh, um, empty page <laughs> anxiety. I don't know where to get started, yeah. right? So kind of, it's not gonna give us exactly correct answers. We, we shouldn't expect that, but we kind of gets us a good start. And from there we can say, oh, well, we can fix that. We can make adjustments there. That's not right and whatever, but it gets us, gets us going. So yes. really relate to that anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. On the boarding side, we've also really been having a lot of success leveraging it for things that are a little bit more tedious, like if we're writing acceptance criteria for user stories, or if we're writing test cases and we want to make sure that they're all complete. So those are things that can, you know, they have some certain structure, which can feel a little tedious when we're doing it mm -hmm. um, on our own. And if we're leveraging Gen AI, it just kind of gets that piece of it out of the way. And again, we can kind of use just our our thought to uh, to create, um, uh, to make it more accurate, to make it more complete, et cetera. Yeah. So it's really yeah, useful. Yeah, so it helps in both sides. If it's too yeah. hard, so you can use uh, AI to reduce the stress. And if it's too easy and boredom, so you can uh, use AI to automate stuff and to do things that are really easy, but you don't want to do them. So give right. it to someone yeah. else. 
Yeah. And I think an important point here is that it really helps also, not just if I'm working alone individually, but both as a team, when we're working as a team together and we're kind of wanting to uh, make a little more progress or uh, kind of we're deliberating, should we do it this way or that way? So then, you know, hey, let's get our uh, yeah, let's have a friend, <laughs> a professional friend to help us. A professional friend. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that's a little bit about flow. Let's talk about team flow now. All right. So team flow is really this state in which, um, from the from the agile perspective, Safe describes it as a state in which agile teams deliver a continuous flow of value to the customer. So again, here we see this value that we're looking to bring to the customer. We want it to be continuous, right? So not just a one-time big thing, but rather something that is um, uh, uh, going on and on uh, sustainably. And from your perspective? Yeah, so group flow in, in terms of positive psychology, and this is a, there is a guy named Keith Sawyer, uh, who is the person who uh, kind of discovered, not discovered, but first coined the term uh, group flow. And he mm -hmm. says uh, the, um, flow, the group flow is a spontaneous collaboration of group creativity and improvisation actions. So he uh, studied in the uh, University of North Carolina. Um, he studied uh, creativity and group performance. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So mm -hmm. I will also tell a little bit about the guy, Keith Sawyer. So he used to be a jazz musician. Well, he is still a jazz musician and he's also a psychologist. And, and he uh, figured that there is this click moment when he and his band are playing together. And there is this moment it, that it feels like there's a kind of a collective flow. It's not that each and every individual is in its own flow, but there's something collective. And he wanted to research that. So he okay. went out to a 20 years research and, and he wow. figured out a few of the group flow triggers, which is basically the conditions to uh, be in the group flow. So I will present a few of them. So the first one um, is called shared goals. So we know that in flow, we need to have a clear goal, but in a group flow, we need to have shared goals. So we need to understand how we contribute to the big picture. It means that if, if there is a team and there are different, um, there is a AI, there is, I'm sorry, there is designer and there is a developer and there are different kind of uh, different people with different roles, how are they contributing to the one shared goal that everybody has? So this is really important to uplift motivation and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the next group flow trigger, which is familiarity. So when we know each other and we understand their uh, tics and tendencies and you understand their voice intonation and you, you know their story. So this really, really helps for flow. So familiarity is a very group flow, is a very high group flow trigger. The next one says everybody counts. It means that each one in the team should be involved because if someone even one is not involved and is kind of stepping out. So he will kind of damage the performance of all the group. And what it means is that if there is someone who is not really involved, so the group should help him be more involved. And if he's not willing to be involved, so they can help them decide either you're in or out. But if you're in between, so it kind of damages the performance of the whole group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So those are just a few of the triggers, right? There are 10 total uh, team flow or group flow triggers. We won't cover all of them in this uh, session, but we're going to take now uh, um, kind of all this, uh, these topics that we talked about flow and team group flow and, and kind of look at them from the perspective of the agile team events that we experience in our day to day. And we'll be um, seeing some of those challenges that we encounter there and how this understanding more of the team flow uh, can help us there. So first of all, one thing to note is that, that the heartbeat that this uh, rhythm or cadence that we have within the Agile organizations where we have the, uh, the iteration and for those who are um, practicing SAFE or, or kind of the PI or quarterly, um, uh, time boxes as well. So all of that creates a little bit more predictability 
within the chaos in which a lot of us are having to, to build, develop, and work, right? So this is what these Agile team events allow us to, uh, to experience. So briefly, because we, we do have mostly experienced Agile people here, but just kind of a, a recap and making sure we're on the same page terminology wise. So let's assume we're, we're gonna be talking about the Agile team events because those are the most prevalent and we occur very frequently, but you can apply many of these to the bigger, like if you're doing arts or uh, larger organizations can be applied there as well. So I'll we have the events. I'll just add that events is also called meeting. So if you're yeah. not familiar with the, with the naming in the Agile, so events mm -hmm. are a kind of meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these meetings can be relevant in many, many of these situations can be relevant in many meetings. So, you know, we, we have our time boxes, we take the timeline, we split it into iterations or sprints. Most organizations choose two week sprints or iterations. Um, and let's just see that we have here uh, um, the, the weekly, uh, bi-weekly cadence. So we do recommend having backlog refinement meetings or events. We'll talk about them a little bit where these are meant to help us prepare for, um, to prepare the backlog, make sure that everybody is familiar with the backlog, that we've asked all our questions and the team is clear, clear on what are the next things that we're gonna be wanting to be working on. And usually those are gonna be somewhere in the middle of the iterations. There might be once a week or, or once an iteration. Then at the beginning of the iteration, we have, of course, iteration planning, where the team plans what can they achieve and how are they going to achieve that. And then throughout the iteration, we have the daily stand up or team sync where we get together, we figure out what issues do we have and um, make sure that we're synchronized and, and heading in the right direction. And then, of course, at the end of the iteration, we have the iteration review where we will demonstrate what we have achieved in this iteration and get feedback on that. And um, and then we have the iteration retrospective where we discuss how can we improve. Um, I see in the comments, yes, these are uh, Scrum events primarily, that's that's true. But a lot of uh, teams, even if they are more Kanban related uh, or kind of uh, focused teams, they will borrow oftentimes at least some of these events. All right, so now that we kind of uh, have the terminology in place, and again, I'm sure most of you are uh, quite familiar with these. So let's see for a moment, what are your team, um, Agile team events main challenges? Let's switch over to the Mentimeter. And we will, we have here a list of kind of top 10 issues that we uh, have seen um, where we are uh, going to, um, you'll be able to rank these and you can decide, you can. You don't have to go through all of them, but maybe uh, kind of take a top three or top uh, five items out of here. We'll put also in the chat the code. And kind of let you get in there and you need to select and pull up the items that you want. And then um, after you're done selecting, hit submit at the bottom. So it'll take a moment for everybody to connect. Okay. Maybe I'll read this, these in the meantime. So um, some, some challenges that we see out in the field are backlog refinements where people are having a challenge shifting from the day-to-day -day work that they're doing to this um, talking about the future. We've got... Uh, um, shifting from between talking about things that are coming up really, really soon versus things that are farther away. We've got difficulty in prioritization or focus. And then in the iteration planning, we have sometimes unclear priorities or stories or lack of commitment. Team's not committing. So currently the one who's, who's winning is lack of priorities and focus. This is what it seems like in the yeah. backlog of refinement. Yeah, we'll give people a chance because uh, there's a little, quite a lot to read, but very curious what people are selecting here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the daily stand up, not being able to see the big picture or not caring about what, what are other people on the team updating on, who cares, that kind of attitude. Okay. 
All right, so we see we have some top winners here with some backlog refinement challenge and iteration retrospective, two of the challenges kind of at the top. Um, uh, more backlog refinement, some daily stand up. So great. So feel free to continue to fill these in. We'll go back now to the actual um, slides. All right. Okay. So we'll start kind of in this order. We'll start with the backlog refinement first. We'll talk about the main challenges and then we'll understand what are what is the uh, kind of science behind the challenge we're experiencing and then offer some ideas for solutions. Okay, so we'll start out with this one. Um, this challenge, Ori, that we see in the field, people complain, you know, we know it's important to look ahead in the backlog and to get an idea of what's coming up and to have good conversations, but it's really hard for people to shift from Today, I'm working on developing a particular story for this iteration, and now you're trying to talk with me about something that is coming up later on in the next iteration or farther out. So what does the yeah. science say about this? So yeah, it is uh, actually, it is quite challenging. And the reason why it's so challenging is that when we are shifting from working mode to planning mode, we are actually switching between two different brain networks. So when we switch between brain networks, uh, what happens is that our brain is using a lot of energy in order for this kind of shift. And mm -hmm. then when we do it a lot, we're starting to feel tired and we're starting to feel that we're not, not, we cannot focus. So it means that we don't, we don't want to shift a lot between this working mode and this planning mode because it's different kind of brain networks. Yeah. So let's see the solution, what can we do? Yeah. So what we see that a lot of teams are finding useful to deal with this is they'll actually schedule the backlog refinement kind of towards the end of the day, or maybe it's towards the end of the week. Some teams don't don't have uh, the iterations ending on the weekend, um, so it might be more convenient for those types of uh, uh, teams. But in any case, try trying to avoid having it during the peak flow time where people are actively really working on their day-to-day um, -day current stories and allowing for that at least the context switching is happening only one time and then they kind of can concentrate on the refinement and then you know maybe go on with their uh go home so that's right. kind of and now that the peak flow time is usually in the early time in the morning for most of the people that's the peak flow time that's the time when mm -hmm. they're most focused so you don't want to take this valuable time okay, okay right let's see this next one. yeah so we'll look at the next one so this is a little bit similar, but slightly different. When we're in the backlog refinement, we, I mean, to refine the backlog, sometimes we're talking about things that are really close, stories that are just around the corner to the upcoming iteration, versus sometimes we're looking at stories that are farther away, maybe some future epics or features that, you know, perhaps we'll only be really working on in a couple of months. And, you know, people are having a challenge with that shift as well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you can think about it like uh, think of a camera. And when you have a camera and you want to zoom in and then you want to zoom out. So what happens? It uses a lot of power of the battery, right? So the same thing goes to our mind. When we try to zoom in and focus on the details, and then we're kind of zooming out and focus on the big picture, it's quite of the same of moving between different kind of networks. Okay. So there are different networks for zooming in and for zooming out. It's also known as the um, divergent thinking and convergent thinking. Uh, basically, divergent is more like open opportunities and mm -hmm. convergent is more kind of, let's focus and try to reduce the opportunities in order to make decisions and make choices. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the difference and we want to separate. Yeah, so maybe tell us how you separate that. Yeah, so what helps with this is really to, um, whether if we're having separate backlog, two backlog refinement sessions, one in each week of the iteration, for example, then we can choose one of those will be more of the stuff coming up, you know, more of the detailed uh, discussions and um, and then have the other meeting be for, for things that are further out. We'll pick a feature or epic that is further out that we need to think about. Maybe we need to story map it and, and figure out how to break it apart, you know? So basically when we're looking at our backlog, 
some part of the meet uh, that meeting can be more uh, the first one could be more detailed the other one could be more like looking farther ahead if we're only having one such uh, backlog refinement meeting in an iteration that's okay too we can decide to start with one or the other maybe start with the more detailed up front get that out of the way so people aren't worried about what's just around the corner we can take a little break and then shift over to the things that are further down um, in the future Okay. All right. So our last but not least for uh, the challenge that we have with backlog refinements, it is one of those quite a challenging uh, meeting that we have. And as somebody mentioned, uh, Thomas mentioned in the Slack, in the in the chat, uh, if we don't get it right, then it actually has a lot of bad effects on the following, um, the way that things go during the um, uh, the this iteration. So we sometimes have lack of prioritization or focus. We kind of are getting lost because we do go through a lot of information during these kinds of meetings. Yeah, so there is this tendency that we have, which is the tendency to uh, to be less focused, basically, uh, unless we have something that brings us back to the focus. And this is due to the what is called the dopamine bias. Dopamine is, is a neurotransmitter. It's a hormone also that enhances our motivation and engagement, but it is also increasing the distractibility. So it means that when uh, when I'm um, when I feel dopamine, so I, I'm more like uh, I want to learn more stuff, I want to know new things, I want to open opportunities. And this is why we need somehow to gain back our focus. Because if we don't have something specific that will bring us back to our focus, whether it's our willpower or whether it's someone else or something else, so we will by default be more uh, kind of spread out. Right. So this is why it's so important. And we do have with Scrum or, you know, Agile, we will have a person who's facilitating the, the meeting or event. Of course, it's important in any meeting, not just in the Agile focused events. Um, but uh, so for, for us, usually it's going to be the Scrum Master or the Agile uh, team coach or, or team lead, whatever we're calling it in our organization. And the importance here is that they really need to help focus these um, uh, these events. Uh, certainly with the backlog refinement, the product owner or product management is going to be primarily kind of driving that meeting, but uh, our Scrum Master or uh, team coach can help us there. Now we also, again, here, we have a lot of experience these days now with, with the AI tools out there. These are just some examples. You can use Spinach or Otter to sit in with you in the meeting, basically, that tool will take notes for you. So that way the person who is typically facilitating, making sure we're on, tar on target, making sure we're taking action items, doing all that stuff, gets a little bit of help or e even a lot of help along the way. So that's something to also explore. This is amazing. I just thinking like maybe one year back, you, you can think about this kind of thing in a meeting. Right. Right. And I can tell you that we've experimented with spinach also in, you know, not in English, and it's quite, uh, quite good as well. Again, it's kind of like 80% correct. And then you have to kind of fix the 20% that it got a little bit off. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. so moving on. So let's talk about the iteration planning our event at the beginning of each iteration, we have here two uh, challenges. So the first is the unclear priorities or stories, of course, hello. Our backlog refinement meeting is exactly for that, to try to get our backlog in place before the iteration planning. Uh, but still, sometimes we uh, have challenges there. So. Yes. So what the neuroscience says is basically that the, the first main trigger for flow is clear goals. If we have clear goals, it's much more easier for us to be focused. Because once the goals are not clear, and when there's this kind of a vagueness, so what our mind is doing is always trying to figure out, wait, am I doing the right thing that I should do? Is this mm -hmm. the actual goal? And what am I going to do next? So this kind of thinking of planning is damaging mm -hmm. the, the working mode. So remember we talked before about switching between working and planning. So yeah. if the goal is not clear, so we're doing this kind of switch a lot of times during our working hour. I've literally seen people sitting in the room at iteration planning events and they're like, okay, not only do I need to figure out what my what our team capacity is for this iteration for the next two weeks, but I also am not really sure I'm clear on what these stories are that we um, you know, are being asked to commit to. 
And so this is why a lot of teams find it really useful to use the definition of ready. Okay, so this is different from the definition of done, which is a little bit more familiar to people. Definition of done is about what are the things we need to do to complete something for it to be done at the end of the, or by the end of the iteration, whenever we're done with it. Uh, definition of ready is actually what are, what's kind of like our checklist for things that need to be uh, in place before we feel we are ready to get started on this story, before we can actually take it into the iteration planning. And what we do is we leverage this and we use this for during the backlog refinement to ensure that all of our stories or our product backlog items are, are well prepared. And this is just an example of things that you can kind of ensure are um, happening. Of course, we wanna know that the business values clearly are articulated, that acceptance criteria are clear, and we actually know how we're gonna be testing this, um, UX guidelines in place, et cetera. So all these are just examples and for your, own team, it's a great idea to have the definition of ready clarified. And that way, when you are at the backlog refinement, the earlier event we talked about, we can ensure that we have this in place. So then by the time we get to the iteration planning, only the last question maybe we had open that we're, we were just, um, you know, kind of needing to talk to a customer or, or needing to check the code, we just kind of finalize anything that's opening open. And then we can now take, you know, have a, a discussion about, okay, what's our team capacity and what, you know, what can we really achieve from the things we want? Yes. All right, let's go on to the next challenge we have. So sometimes we get to the situation where there's a sense of, well, we don't really have commitment from the team or not from all team members about uh, what we're actually going to be achieving. And then when things don't work out during the iteration, they're like, well, you know, we never thought it was possible anyway. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so remember uh, Keith Sawyer and the group flow triggers. So one of the trigger for group flow is everybody counts. So if, again, if someone uh, or some people are not really committed, so again, this is uh, preventing the team to get into, uh, into the group flow state. So it means that, Everybody counts, even if there is one person in the team that is not committed and didn't say in a clear way that this is the T is in and he's committed. Uh, so we're going to see some difficulties in the in the future. Yeah. Okay. So you know the the way we approach this in the iteration planning is highly recommend not only to discuss the stories and which stories were committing to do, but to actually define an iteration goal, one or two sentences that we can agree on that are aligned with where we're trying to go as far as what our product owner or manager is uh, kind of asking and things we, we would like to achieve and what we can actually achieve. And then we'll actually do a thumb voting, you know, really briefly, you can see here, you could just do it very uh, simply, yay, I'm, uh, I'm on board with this. I, I think we can definitely achieve it. <laughs> I'm not so sure or no, this is a problem. And we want to be very respectful for somebody who is saying, nope, there's a problem or I'm not so sure, because that's where a lot of times we see risks that are coming up and they will point out by indicating this, we can have that deeper conversation and understand what is the uh, reason. And then we can adjust what we're taking on as a team to ensure it is really something that the whole group can agree to. So it's interesting how some of these practices over time have evolved you know, in in um, and, and very similar to what uh, the research you mentioned is suggesting. Yes. The other thing, and this again is another opportunity. We have some tools in AI that actually will kind of listen in on the conversation and give us an indication whether we had kind of a uh, an equal participation from the different people. Okay, so yeah. we can use this for iteration planning, but it's also relevant for things like the retrospective or other. Uh, events or meetings where we want to ensure people are all kind of involved in a in a in a reasonably you know uh, equal way. And um, here is just an example. There are other things out there. Also, something to to explore that we see is uh, is powerful. Yeah, we'll just add that it's uh, it's called equal participation, but it's not really equal because we we just need to know that everybody had his mind into the conversation contributed in a way it doesn't have to be like the same percentage but you have to say something yeah yeah good all right so moving on so we talked about backlog refinement we talked about iteration planning daily stand up so we're doing this 
every day. So these are super important. Um, we wanna make sure that these are effective. And one of the challenges, and we get this all the time, people feel like, oh, <laughs> we're talking so long on a particular topic during the daily, just gets very tiring and uh, kind of, you know, and then I start to lose focus on what people are, are talking about. Yeah. So in neuroscience, there is this notion which is called the science of safety. And uh, basically what it means, it's uh, our nervous system is kind of signaling us, is signaling to the brain, when is it safe? And there are certain things that kind of uh, trigger an unsafe situation. For example, if there are no clear boundaries, if there's no clear time boundaries, and maybe no clear kind of uh, participation boundaries when maybe someone is talking 80, 90% of the meeting and you're feeling very uncomfortable because you also want to have your time. So mm -hmm. basically you want to have some clear time boundaries. You want to know when is the meeting going to start and end. And if someone wants to uh, have more time than the others, so maybe just say it in advance that I have something and not kind of, you know, um, take all the time. But there are mm -hmm. all other solutions. Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, what, what we see, and this is a very common practice, um, most teams are kind of trying to, to, to go in this direction, is to say in advance, look, the purpose of this daily or team sync, it's just to get uh, an understanding of what are the main challenges that we currently have. So we're going to spend the for the 10, 15 minutes of this to actually uh, kind of go through and understand what are the problems. And those we're gonna kind of take note real quick. What are the challenges that we're having? Maybe we're needing something from legal. Maybe we're uh, stuck because of some problem with the particular environment, whatever's the challenge. And then we will have the meet after, right? After those 10, 15 minutes are over, only those people who are who it's relevant for will stay to discuss the offline topics, okay? And that's a very common practice, um, but still we see sometimes teams that are not doing it and you know these take forever and um, uh, we end up yeah. uh, kind of losing focus. Sometimes you just need to know, let's take this offline or let's take it later yeah. when you see that it's too much. Right, exactly. But but people want to know that if it's taken offline, that it is actually something's going to happen with it. Otherwise, they kind of won't let go on unless they know that somebody's going to take care of it. So that's why having the meet after right afterwards can be really, really useful. Yeah. Okay. So the other challenge that we have is that people kind of get lost in all the details. You know, we're hearing from different people. A lot of times we have people going around the room and saying, what did they do? What are they going to do? What impediment they have? And, you know, by the time, you know, once I've kind of said what I need to share about, I'm kind of losing interest in what others are talking about. And I kind of don't see how this all ties up to something interesting for me. Yeah. So I guess th these kind of things happens Usually when we're too stressed, when we feel that we have too much things on our plate and we don't have the capacity to hear others, and, and it's fine, but you should know that when we clarify the big picture and see the connection between our work and other people's work, so it has some really good effects. First of all, it reduces stress levels because you can kind of zoom out and see the bigger picture. This helps reduce stress. It also creates a sense of meaning because again, you get a sense of meaning when you can zoom out from your specific task and understand how it contributes to the big picture. It mm -hmm. also helps to connect the team to share goals. And this is increasing the motivation of all the team. So next time, if you, if you feel that someone is talking too much and mm -hmm. you don't really want to know what he's hearing, Maybe just try to think, how is it connected to the big picture? And maybe how can I help or how can he help me? Because this is also something that's happening in the daily stand-up. Mm -hmm. Right. So actually what in practice we find really, really useful is to shift from this going around the room, each person kind of updating about their stuff to a, a more Kanban-like approach, which is to walk the board is what it's called. So basically we keep in mind what are the iteration goals. We define those together in the iteration planning. And now when we are during the daily, we'll take a look at our board together. And let's just say if this is our team board, we're gonna start at the end of the board. We'll look at 
uh, or if there's something to uh, update regarding something uh, done, great. If not, immediately we go to the next one. And we basically have a, uh, whoever is participating in this will briefly share what's going on and if they have some challenge. Now, each of these columns is going to be prioritized. Um, things here are going to be prioritized. So we'll talk about them in the order of importance. Whatever's at the top will be the highest priority. And then after we've uh, discussed these, we go to the earlier column. And this way, if we're having a problem with some um, particular item, we can quickly see with the team who can help out. And as a team, we will be focusing more on completing these items. We call that stop starting, start finishing. And um, by reminding ourselves as well, what are the iteration goals? We are together as a team really staying focused on getting those achieved, okay? And not kind of getting lost in who's working on what kind of... Uh, as we might be. Otherwise. Yeah, this, this is a great practice. It also helps to kind of uh, adjust the challenge skill balance, because if I have a challenge and I'm facing like a really high challenge, this is the time, the daily is the time when I can ask for help and I can get some advice for other people. And this will help to kind of adjust the, the challenge with other people's skill. Mm -hmm. There's a question here. I'll just uh, kind of answer it on uh, on the way. So is there an assumption that everyone in the team has a work item? So not necessarily. We might have an item that a uh, few people are involved in. So one or more of them will kind of briefly update. And um, we might uh, also, some teams don't even assign the items to anybody. I mean, just whoever's involved in that item will be sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's move on to our fourth event, the iteration review, basically the event that we are having at the end of the iteration. And this is where we're going to be sharing with the, everybody what have we achieved and demonstrating it. And a lot of challenges that we have, a lot of times we see a challenge here, kind of this discomfort about, okay, well, um, this is the opportunity to give feedback because something that has been demoed and maybe um, you know, I like it, maybe I don't like it. I can see some things that need improvement. And then also, you know, how much should we be celebrating? What if we didn't achieve everything that we wanted? You know, so kind of this tension around that over there. Yes. Yeah, so there is some science behind that. And uh, some of the science says that we are pretty poor in celebrating wins. This is not something that we are good at. And there is a reason for that. Uh, because when we celebrate, so for example, think about a, a really big challenge that you celebrated and you say to the team, well done, we did it. And then there is this kind of voice who's saying, maybe now they're going to turn down the volume and they're going to kind of rest on this winning yeah. and not go back to work. So yeah. basically celebrating wins is a kind of a way to signal that we achieved a step. And when we signal this thing, something in our brain is is happy because there's this dopamine hormone that is uh, released when we celebrate a win. Another thing that happened is also that we decrease our um, cognitive load because cognitive load is also all the things that are still open in our mind. And if we remember that we have this celebration, we have this thing, so we know that we close it in a way, and it also helps to reduce uh, cognitive load. So there's also some researches um, from Brene Brown in her book, uh, Dare to Lead, which is an amazing book I truly recommend. And so she said that uh, recognition is a validated factor proven by science is validated in increasing uh, employee engagement, satisfaction, and retention rates. Actually, retention rates goes up when you celebrate uh, goals with new employees, when you get give them your feedback on good things that they did. Right. So, so actually, the solution? Yeah. 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 So to, to address this challenge. So, um, you know, I've encountered teams that kind of might skip the iteration review because they kind of feel like, well, what's the point? And maybe, you know, it's not uh, uh, necessary, but actually, you know, we really, from my experience, it's really important not to skip it. It's really that opportunity, like you say, to um, to recognize what we have achieved, to 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 see it with our eyes. Of course, it's a working software, a working system, which we know is super important. And we want to leverage that event for both that recognition, but also to provide feedback. And a way we can do that is we can 
um, kind of uh, apply um, a little bit more structure to the agenda of the iteration review. We can start out by looking at the iteration goals. Did we achieve them? You know that those one or two sentences we defined at the beginning of the iteration in the iteration planning. Okay, we can celebrate those aspects that we did achieve. We um, demo the completed story, solicit feedback immediately. So, hey, what do people have to say? Um, take note of those um, uh, that feedback that we are uh, getting. We can reflect, of course, on, on things we didn't achieve and identify any risks, and, et cetera, and understand what the impact is on the quarterly or PI objectives that we defined. This is um, some uh, agenda based on an uh, example in the Scaled Agile website, and you can find it also on their website as well. But the idea is don't skip it. Make sure that you have that um, balance of both uh, uh, some recognition and some feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're coming up on our last team event. We've got the iteration retrospective where we're talking about what are the ways in which we can improve. And uh, one of the things that we see is that we um, have a challenge a lot of times where we talked, we kind of did, we talked, we talked, we got everything out that we were kind of uh, concerned with, but ultimately nothing came out of it, okay? Nothing changed afterwards. So mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, there's this um, um, positive psychology, another positive psychologist, his name is Martin Seligman. He's like the pioneer of positive psychology. And he coined the term learning helplessness, which is what happens after you kind of, you promise to yourself something and you don't do it and then you don't do it again and then you don't do it again. And then there was, will be this time when you will say, uh, it's not going to happen. It basically, it means that if you're suffering from failure or some kind of uh, uh, something is winning you time after time after time after time, there will be a point where you will say, I cannot do it. And this is also called the fixed mindset, which means that uh, things cannot really change. Uh, and this is not a place that we want to get there. We want to kind of build our kind of uh, personality of a person who can do what he's uh, aiming to do. But for that, um, we're going to know, to, we want to be really realistic. So I think maybe you can say some things about that, Ronnie. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's not only the individual, it's also as a team. We want to shift away from this kind of learned helplessness of feeling like, well, no matter what we do, we can't change this or that. Um, and, you know, for example, in situations where maybe we've got lots of bugs coming in from production and we feel like every time this is happening to us and we can't achieve all the stuff we wanted because of we're spending, I don't know, like 40 percent of our time on those bugs. Well, let's talk about what we can achieve and what how do we want to handle this given situation at this time? OK, so, uh, for example, be realistic at the iteration planning. Let's understand we have to put aside capacity, allocate some capacity capacity to these um, uh, bugs. So maybe currently it's 40%. Okay, we'll be practical about that. Um, and then we will start to gain some confidence in our ability as a team, at least to not be so overwhelmed when these challenges, when these situations happen. And then at the next iteration, for example, we can decide, okay, now what do we want to do about the fact that it takes us 40% of the capacity? What are areas of the code that we can improve, that we can refactor? Let's you know, take a realistic action item that we can actually um, do within our scope of influence. And if you do only one thing in a retrospective, at least get one realistic action item that the team feels like they can really achieve and then work at um, actually doing it at the um, during that yeah, iteration. I think basically, it means that you want to use the challenge skill balance. You want to see maybe if we talked about it so much and we didn't do anything about it, maybe the challenge is too high for us. Or yeah. maybe we don't have the skills for that. So kind of be realistic and remember the challenge skill balance because this is always like the thing that kind of if we tweak it a little bit, so it, it might do the work. Yes, absolutely. So the other challenge that we have, it's a little bit kind of on the flip side, where we didn't actually talk about the things that really matter to us, okay? And, you know, we kind of got in there and we didn't uh, have a meaningful conversation. We kind of just talked about easy stuff or things yeah. that are less important. 
So uh, here there's again the science of safety, uh, which is uh, basically based on Stephen Porges' uh, researches about the nervous system. And basically what he says is when we are nervous, we are not open to others. So our nervous system has different states. You probably know the fight and flight and freeze states, but there's also a state which is called social engagement or play. And this state is not available for us when we don't feel safe. So what happens is our body is sending signals of safety or danger uh, to the brain. And when we are stressed, it's kind of sends signals of danger. And when we feel danger, we are less open to others. And this is something that is related to the chemicals in our body. If we have more stress chemicals than relaxed uh, chemicals, it can happen. It also related to the uh, sympathetic nervous system, which is more activated. So we kind of, we want to have some tools to kind of balance the mm -hmm. nervous system in order to be more open. Yeah. Okay. So um, what, what we can understand from this is that we really, and, and we know this, that uh, research has shown that the number one factor for uh, the effectiveness of having highly performing teams is the psychological safety. It's the number one thing. It's not about whether you've got the best, you know, stars on your team, but it's much, much more important how comfortable do they feel together? Can they feel, be vulnerable and be comfortable to share, you know, mistakes that they made, areas that they are challenged by and that they feel maybe are not so sure about, that they need help with. So the psychological safety is really important. And in the retrospective, which is really the most sensitive meeting that we've got, this kind of this event where we're uh, really sharing, um, you know, our, our uh, uh, sometimes our deepest concerns and, and um, uh, things that we would like to improve. Well, this is, we want to get people feeling comfortable at first. So it's really important to set up of the retrospective. We want to start out with some appreciations. Um, it can be a personal sharing to, to improve our familiarity with each other. Of course, we can do that also in other contexts, but to kind of get set the stage for the retrospective, that can also be really, really powerful. Um, and then there are also some breathing techniques for reducing this uh, a little bit of the stress. And, you know, naturally this is it's something that uh, um, we want to make sure that the environment is such that people are comf feeling comfortable to share. So our leaders, our managers need to be uh, generating that kind of space in our organization. But within the team, there are things that we can do. So let's see a little bit, just one um, example of how we can leverage a breathing technique just at the beginning of the retrospective. So yeah, I would just say that breathing is one of the most potent techniques in order to gain like a really quick change in our nervous system balance. Uh, breathing is is like, it's like the number one technique for that. And, and I will just say that it's not always at the first time. Sometimes you need to do it one time and then another time. And then after a few times, your nervous system kind of learn the breathing techniques. And it's not, uh, you don't have to think about the breathing. You can just get into this zone of breathing. So we're going to do now a practice of breathing, which is called, also, it's called the box breathing. Uh, it's basically, it means that we're going to breathe in to the count of four through our nose. Then we're going to hold our breath to the count of four, then breathe out to the count of four and hold to the count of four. So I'm going to count with you so you can uh, you can go with the, with the rhythm and you can just hit start. Okay, and, and it's all one. Yeah. One minute, you ready? Okay, let's breathe in and hold and breathe out. Hold, breathe in, hold, breathe out, hold, breathe in, hold, out, through the mouth, hold, in through the nose, hold, Hold. Hold. 
Okay, that was a short practice, but I would quickly. say that the minimum that you want to start with is two minutes. Two minutes is kind of the minimum that you can start to start feel some kind of change in your nervous system. And this is a great thing to start, I guess, any meeting, if you can do that. Uh, it will help the meeting go much more with a more focused and more calm way. So Ori, there was a comment in the chat and I can kind of understand, you know, a lot of techies may be a little more skeptical, cynical, you know, maybe they're kind of not gonna want to try this out. What, what do you have to say about that? So there is so much science that is backing that up. And there are so many companies uh, that are working with this thing, companies that, that really su su succeed, that they know that this is a thing that can really help. And you don't need to think about it as kind of a woo-woo stuff. It's, it's just science. You know, it's breathing. If you know how to breathe right, you kind of regulate your nervous system. And basically, this is what a lot of the pharmacy is doing. Pharmacy is kind of changing the, the chemistry in our body. And we have our breath. Our breath is the one number one thing that can change the chemistry from kind of too stressed into relaxation. And also the opposite. If you're too relaxed and you want to wake up, you want to be more focused, so you can breathe in a different way. So basically, there are even different breathing techniques for uh, different um, results that you want to gain, whether it's waking up, whether it's relaxing, whether it's be more focused, and you have uh, different kind of techniques for, for each one of them. Well, so maybe we can talk to the, you know, get get people who are more uh, techie might, might uh, kind of listen into the uh, research scientific aspects behind it to, to maybe give it to chance. Yeah, okay. yeah, you should do that. All right, awesome. Okay, folks, so we're kind of at the tail end of the webinar. So just to kind of wrap up and summarize, uh, we hope that you can see with us that by understanding the science behind some of these challenges that we have in our day-to-day -day Agile team events, we can really understand why some tweaks, some small changes, really not something so dramatic, but things really that are some practices that can be useful in, in our team events. Um, you know, and when we remember that they compound over time, you know, we do this iteration after iteration after iteration, you know, we can gradually get that additional small improvement over and over and over again to our personal and our team flow. And what we do know is that by doing that over time, we actually really can increase the productivity and creativity of our people, of our team, of our organization. So, yeah. you know, and it's not so hard to do. It's small things that you can kind of pick up and try out. And, you know, hopefully that will be useful for everybody. I want to add to the compound, compounding impact that, that this is also a skill. So being in the zone, getting into the flow state, getting more focused, it's a skill. It's not something that you have or don't have. And when you start to practice the skill, you have compounding impacts because you're starting to be better and better at that. And things are starting to be more fast, more productivity, more calm. And this is when you can gain a skill that will help you not only in your work productivity, but also in life, in, in yeah. your personal life, with your relationships. If you're more focused in your rela relationships, they're much more deep. And it may be in your hobbies. If you have a hobby, you like to play the guitar, or you like to go dance. So it also increases that. It, it kind of amplified everything because when you know how to be uh, more in the moment, every activity is much better. Yeah, I can def definitely tell you that I have practiced that in my own personal life and find it really, really useful. Um, okay, so, you know, our uh, training uh, department at Agile Sparks just wanted me to share also some of our classes that are coming up. So you can, uh, everybody who's registered to the webinar can get a 10% discount on our courses. So feel free to look us up. And um, also Ori as well. Yeah, so you can uh, you can check the QR code. This will uh, lead you to my LinkedIn page, and we can chat there. I uh, I do uh, workshops and lectures to companies, to teams, and I work one on one with individuals, and managers, entrepreneurs. Uh, so feel free to contact me, and we can chat through there. 
Awesome. Great. And guys, we'll, we'd love to get in touch, you know, and stay in touch with you. So feel free to connect with either of us on LinkedIn and we'll stick around. So if anybody has any questions, you can put it in the Q&A pa panel. We really appreciate you being here. It was really fun. I learned a lot from this experience with Oli and, you know, kind of over time recognizing, oh, we do this. Now I, you know, I can really understand the science behind it, even though I've seen it work in practice, but now, you know, it really makes sense. So thank you, Oli, for, for this, uh, you know, joint webinar doing it. Yes, together. thank you, Ronnie. And I saw how, how all the neuroscience is kind of built it into a system that works with big organization, which is amazing. Like how you can take this kind of state and, yeah. and scale it up to organizations. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I just feel like, you know, um, coming to my uh, teams and clients that I work with, I can really help them understand better now the why, you know, like a lot of times mm -hmm. engineers just want well, to why are you, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? So really helps kind of uh, understand it better. So, all right. Well, take care, everybody. Um, we don't, I uh, don't see any questions right now. So if anybody wants the last chance for questions will be great. And if not, just a reminder that you'll all get this um, recording uh, and uh, emailed. Okay, so you can definitely watch it with anybody you want and we appreciate it a lot. So take care and best of luck. Thank and feel free to drop us a note also. If you have practices that you're using today, folks, that you are realizing are leveraging some of these um, insights, that would be really awesome to also hear from you as well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes. Okay. Let's wait for everybody to...